Welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna, episode 39, brought to you by Loserpool.com. As ever, I'm your host, Harry Simiou, and on this edition, we'll be looking back at the narrow victory over Huddersfield Town. Lucas Torreira, the main man, digging us out of a bit of a hole there, it has to be said. Now, on this edition, we'll be hearing from Chris Davison and Mems, uh, and of, of course, I'll be giving my thoughts on uh, Saturday's game. Don't forget you can join in the debates via Twitter. You can find us at Chronicles underscore AFC. Always happy to respond to any comments and, of course, include the best ones and the best questions on the shows as often as I can. So thanks for your continued support and constant interaction. It means a great deal to us. So it was Arsenal 1, Huddersfield Town nil in the end. Uh, far from a comfortable victory I guess you could say I think we struggled um, to break them down for the most part particularly in the second half we didn't really create a great deal has to be said we created a few opportunities in the first half which we unfortunately wasted I think the two that come to mind were the one that Aubameyang sort of tried to divert into the corner after Granit Xhaka's mishit shot and then the one that Alexander Lacazette basically spooned over the crossbar um, after Matteo Guendouzi managed to pick him out. Um, so those are the two chances in the first half that come to mind. Before uh, I continue dissecting the action, I want to start off with the team selection. It was a team selection that surprised many, uh, given the injury to Rob Holding uh, on Wednesday night. I, I think it was pretty obvious that Stefan Licksteiner was going to come in as the third centre-back alongside Socrates and Mustafi. I didn't think... Uh, he looked too good there, if I'm being honest. I know Huddersfield didn't really cause us any problems in the first half uh, when when he was involved, but I just thought he looked uncomfortable in the role. There were a couple of times where I remember him sort of galloping up the right-hand side, and I was thinking to myself, have you forgotten that you're playing centre-back today, not right-back? So I think um, naturally with anybody who's who's been asked to do a job alien to their usual one you know he's going to have take a bit of time to get used to it fortunately Huddersfield weren't good enough on the day to punish us for it so I guess we kind of got away with it um, and then of course there was a midfield of, of Granit Xhaka who returned to the side Matteo Guendouzi and Lucas Torreira something of a, a flat three it has to be said um, and then of course Lacazette and Aubameyang leading the line up front now Interestingly, you know, a lot of people had been calling for the two of them to start up front together for quite a while now. And I guess equally people will be saying after that game that it didn't really work. Um, but the reality is I don't think that was the problem. I think Unai Emery's decision to sort of bypass the uh, the two sort of playmaker positions just behind the striker or wing forward positions, whatever you want to call them, I don't know. But anyway, I thought the decision to bypass them uh, was wrong. I thought that we were too quick to move sort of from midfield to, to the forwards without having any real creativity in the likes of Xhaka, uh, Torreira and Guendouzi. I guess you could argue that they're all defensive minded midfield players. Uh, you know, they all like to get forward, don't they? But all right, maybe defensive is the wrong word. Maybe deep lying. Maybe that's more along the right lines. Um, but anyway, I thought we lacked creativity and none of those guys were, re were really willing to to run on like an Aaron Ramsey would or a Mesut Ozil maybe would and support the forwards. And as a result, I felt the two were a little bit isolated. Wasn't much service coming from the wide areas. Um, 
you know, normally you end up with sort of a Bamiyang out on the left and he distracts whilst Kolasinac comes up on the outside and, and ultimately that causes teams problems. That overload is often the key to opening some of these stubborn defences up. But on this occasion, we didn't have that. It was literally the fullbacks uh, were the only two providing any natural width. And I thought that they were isolated as a result of that. You know, there was no one to distract. There was no one to take the defenders away. And Huddersfield kind of sussed it out and, and, and made sure that we didn't get as much joy from that as we have done in recent weeks. It has to be said, though, you know, Huddersfield Town did uh, press us very well in the first half in particular. Uh, they put us under a lot of pressure in the defensive areas, uh, forced a couple of mistakes out of Granite Xhaka, actually. Uh, not that it needs that much forcing. Um, I, I know I always defend the player, but he is... Uh, very prone to making those errors, isn't he? Where he just gives away a silly pass from time to time, puts us under pressure. Um, and he's, he's kind of his own worst enemy at times. And, and that's a real shame because I think he is a really, really talented footballer. Now, I'd already mentioned that I didn't feel the midfield were willing to to run on, push on and, and get up in support of Lacazette and Aubameyang. And, and whilst I do believe that to be the case, I think... The one time that Lucas Torreira did do that, did gamble and get beyond the forward was the time that he scored. And that, that goes to show, doesn't it, that arriving late in the box from midfield um, can really unsettle defences. Often you arrive unmarked and, and that's the key sometimes to breaking these sides down. I don't think we did it often enough on Saturday. Uh, fortunately, we did it enough uh, once, which was enough in the end to win the game. But throughout the 90 minutes, I didn't think we were creative enough. I didn't think we were daring enough in the final third. And I didn't feel that the strikers got the support that they perhaps needed. Now, Unai Emery again made two substitutions at half time. Uh, Mikitarian and Iwobi came on for Licksteiner and Lacazette. Not sure what happened with Lacazette there. I hope that it was just a tactical decision or, or if not, at least it was precautionary because it seemed a little strange to me. You know, you're, chase, you're chasing a goal at home to Huddersfield Town and you take off one of your most lethal strikers. It didn't really make sense to me. So my suspicion is that maybe there was a little more to that. Hopefully it's not an injury and, and hopefully it's nothing bad um, and, and we'll have him back for the weekend. Now, in the first half, going back to that, Lacazette had a goal ruled out for offside, which I've watched a few times now and I, I'm not entirely sure what the rule is around this. And, it, and it's sad, isn't it, that I'm 28 years old. I've been watching football for most of my life, um, probably since I was five, six years old. And, and I, I don't know what the offside rule is. I don't understand it. My understanding was that Lacazette, yes, he was initially in an offside position, but the flag shouldn't go up until he either obstructs the defender from playing the ball or makes an attempt to play the ball himself. But then the, the defender ends up passing the ball back and straight to Lacazette, who goes around the keeper and scores. Now, yes, Lacazette is in an offside position at the time, but the ball's been played back by the defender. So surely he cannot be penalised for that. I, I'm not sure. If you know the answer to this, feel free to tweet me at chronicles underscore AFC because I've been thinking about this one ever since it happened and I, I can't work it out. My understanding was that if a player played it back uh, like a back pass in error and played it to the striker, he could not be offside. But obviously I'm wrong because the referee felt that that goal shouldn't have stood. And, and I, I guess that was the start of what was a shocking refereeing display, if I'm honest. Um, I thought he just lost total control of the game. He allowed Huddersfield to kick shit out of us in the first half without really punishing anybody. And, and to be honest, I, I was, you know, my blood was boiling. I was absolutely furious with him. Uh, his decision to yellow card our players and, and not book Huddersfield Town players for similar offences was really winding me up. It felt as though a Huddersfield player needed to make five or six fouls before he'd go into the book, whereas an Arsenal player only needed to throw himself to the floor uh, once or, or commit a single foul. Um, and then there was the one with Stefan Licksteiner, wasn't there, where he got involved in a bit of handbags with the Huddersfield Town player, um, and he ended up going into the book for that. Now, interestingly, talking about yellow cards, we do have a couple of suspensions now, don't we? Going into the Southampton game, we'll be without Mustafi, who incidentally came off injured anyway. So I guess 
he may not have been available anyway, but Socrates would have certainly played and, and we're going to be missing him for the trip to Southampton. And that's a real shame because he's brought some real defensive stability to this Arsenal uh, defence this season. Not in terms of the team as a whole, because we still concede goals for fun. But what I mean is he, he's made a real difference. I think he's he's probably our best defender at the moment. Um, he's always willing to battle. And, and the way he's celebrated winning that goal kick as if he scored a goal, you know, that really cheered me up. That's someone who absolutely loves defending. And given the recent injury to Rob Holding, you know, that's a concern that will be without him. Um, oh, well, I guess he can play in the Europa League on Thursday. Now, Let's talk about those diving incidents because we made a huge fuss, didn't we, the week before about Son and, and his theatrics at the Emirates. And I was a bit embarrassed to say that some of our players were doing the same thing this weekend. You know, it is embarrassing, isn't it? Um, the Mustafi one, I think when you look at it again, there's certainly a case for a foul. Um, there's certainly contact. He's certainly got to getting to the ball first and he, he seems to be tripped. But for me, it's the fall. It's the theatrical fall. And, and I know for a fact, having spoken to a number of ex-Premier uh, League referees, that referees are told to look out for the fall. They're told to look out for how the player goes down. And, and that didn't look natural. So if you're the referee and you haven't seen the contact, then you're going to look for the fall. And the way Mustafi launches himself... Um, it's quite embarrassing, really. And, and I guess, whilst I don't think it was a booking, I can see why the referee would have would have deemed that to be simulation. I, I just think that there is, um, you know, there is scope to wave away a penalty appeal without necessarily booking the player. It doesn't mean it's a dive. It could just mean it's not a penalty. And I, and I think Mustafi has been fouled there, but he's just made a meal of it. And, and that's gone against him in the end. Then, of course, there was the Granite Xhaka one. Um, looked like there was a hand on his back. Certainly no contact, sort of the hand on the floor where the ball was. And he's gone over. I don't think it's any different to Delhi Alley's against Leicester. I think it's the same thing. You know, you, you don't really know, do you, whether the player's lost his balance and gone down. Um, again, a yellow card is harsh for me on the basis that as a referee, you cannot be sure he's dived there. And and that's the thing for me. That's my issue. Uh, one player you can be sure dive though at the weekend was Matteo Guendouzi. Um, having got himself to the byline, he, he sort of, it was as though he was waiting for the foul to come. It never come. So he threw himself down anyway. That was definitely a, a dive and, and that one was pretty embarrassing to be honest. But he's a kid. He's picked up a yellow card. He'll learn from it and, and hopefully we won't see it uh, too often from the Frenchman unless it's to our benefit and then I'm all for it. No, I'm only joking. Um, all right, so we've spoken about the referee. We've spoken about the offside goal. We've spoken about the formation, which I didn't particularly agree with. Um, let's talk about Mesut Ozil. Now, there's been lots and lots of debate around Mesut Ozil again. Um, he was... Absent from the team, once again, the word is, the official word is that he's got a back problem. Um, he was seen in the stands on Saturday, uh, surprising a little kid, which is always nice to see, I guess. Uh, so fair play to him for that. And and I just want to defend him a little bit here because, yes, he was dropped from the Bournemouth game. There was lots of talk about him not being physically up to the task and, and Unai Emery fancied a more physical option and, and that was the way he wanted to go. And that's absolutely fine. You know, that that's... That, there's no problem with that. You're more than welcome as the manager and, and it's your right, I guess, to, to change things as you see fit. He then didn't feature against Tottenham and then he didn't feature against Manchester United and the rumours have started again. People talking about him falling out with, with Unai Emery. Well, if I'm honest, I'm sick and tired of this bullshit because there is no proof that Mesut Ozil has fallen out of Unai Emery. No credible source has come out and said it. There's absolutely no substance to this. It's just lazy, boring journalism. People speculating because they got nothing better to do. It's not beyond the realms of possibility that Mesut Ozil is actually injured. And, uh, you know, and that's it. It doesn't have to be a mega story, does it? It could just be that he's injured. Um, 
And, and it's as simple as that. So I'm sick and tired of reading it. Um, and I'm sick and tired of people saying, sell him, get rid of him. We're better off without him. That's not true. Arsenal are a far, far better side with Mesut Ozil in it than they are without him. Uh, if you disagree, you're always welcome to tweet me at Chronicles underscore AFC, of course. But that's my viewpoint on it. Um, and I think at Bournemouth, we missed him. We missed his creativity. I think we missed his creativity against Huddersfield Town as well. Um, you could argue that maybe we were better off without him at Old Trafford and, and against Spurs. But that's just because of the way we opted to play. It doesn't mean he's a bad player. I I, it, I just think he's not going to give you that pressing style, is he, that Emery's obviously uh, so keen on embedding. But in the games where teams sit deep against us and we're struggling to break them down, he is the perfect option, isn't he? Because he, he's capable of playing that one killer pass uh, to open a team up. And, and, and that's what it's all about. Now, the performance wasn't great on Saturday, has to be said, but I don't think we should overreact. I think that was just the consequence of us playing uh, three games in such a small space of time. Spurs took a lot out of us, as did the trip to Old Trafford, and the squad um, is getting thinner by the day based on the injury problems that we're now starting to see uh, creep in. So it's really important that Unai manages the team well um, and, and rotates correctly during this festive period, which we know can be very... Uh, draining on players um, and, and I guess it's important that we do what we did on Saturday and, and grind that results and get over the line uh, in, in these matches in particular so I'm not going to overreact on the performance uh, I will put it down to fatigue mostly but I, I also don't think that Unai Emery's team selection was was right from the beginning and I didn't necessarily think that the substitutions worked either so uh Plenty for him to mull over. He's not going to get it right every game, is he? He's not going to have the magic touch every single week. That would be too much to ask. Uh, but we move on um, to Carabag on Thursday and then Southampton, of course, in the Premier League. So looking forward to those two. And hopefully we can extend the unbeaten run a little bit further. Um, yeah. So I've got to take a short break. And when I return, you'll be hearing from Chris Davison and, of course, the brilliant Mems. Be back in a mo. Right, let's start with Chris Davison. He sent in a short voice clip uh, voicing his thoughts following Saturday's game. Uh, enjoy. Hi, Harry. Hi, everyone. It's Chris Davison here. I hope you are all well. I've literally just got a couple of minutes to go through my thoughts on the Arsenal-Huddersfield game from Saturday. So, of course, absolutely delighted we got the three points um, 21 games unbeaten now. Um, Lucas Torreira to the rescue for us at the weekend with his acrobatic finish. He's making everyone fall in love with him. He's that bloody good. You know, just give someone give him the Ballon d'Or already, to be honest with you. Someone please. <laughs> you know, there's there's a really good feeling around this this club at the moment, Harry. And um, just looking back at the first two games of the season, Man City, Chelsea. Unai Emery, new manager of Arsenal, it was always going to be a really tough ask for us to get anything out of those first two games. And indeed it was. We obviously lost both games. And there was obviously a little bit of worry amongst the fan base and a little bit of uncertainty to see how we'd react from those first two games. But the job Unai has done since then has been absolutely fantastic. I honestly can't ask for any more as an Arsenal fan at the moment. You know, if you were to ask me if we'd be in this position before the start of the season, I probably would have laughed at you. You know, that's how wrong Unai has proved us all to be. You know, we're playing some lovely football at times. The, the fans seem to be united once more. The team seem to be united. Um, just to see the, the passion and energy on the sideline from Unai and his backroom staff as well has been overwhelmingly refreshing as well. So I, I'm a happy gooner at the moment and long may this fantastic form continue. Um, I honestly do believe Unai is the, 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 the right man for the job. And we've got to be honest, there is still a lot of room for improvement. But, you know, you've got to be honest. I do trust Emery with this now and I think he, he can improve us and I think he will. Um, so, yeah, really excited to see what the future holds for this football club with Emery in charge. Um, and, yeah, just, just happy at the moment and really... Um, genuinely excited. So uh, let's see uh, how we get on the next game. Obviously, a nice little break now for for the team, um, for Emery to to do some more homework on the squad. 
So um, hopefully we will keep moving forward because uh, that's certainly what I, I see us doing at the moment. So brilliant. Top stuff. Thanks for having me on again, Harry. Take care. Speak to you all soon. Bye-bye. That was Chris Davison, a very happy gooner uh, after Saturday. And, and he's obviously uh, reiterated his belief in, in Unai Emery and, of course, touched on Lucas Torreira. And I have to say it's true, isn't it? Lucas Torreira has uh, literally made the entire Emirates Stadium fall in love with him already. Um, you know, two goals in three games and one against our bitter, bitter rivals and, and a sort of late winner this weekend. The finish was exquisite, wasn't it? It has to be said. And, you know, I actually spoke to someone after the game who said, why on earth has he tried to bicycle kick that? Isn't that a little risky given the circumstances? But I guess... The truth is, he, he probably couldn't reach it with his head. He's only five foot something, isn't he, uh, Lucas Torreira? So I'm sure uh, there was a method to his madness. But I mean, what a finish it was. Acrobatic or what? Um, showing that he can get off the ground as well, uh, despite being so short and so small. Um, so, yeah. Uh, brilliant finish. Brilliant player. He, he was magnificent throughout again on, on Saturday. The only thing for me now is that when do we give him a rest? I think he's played a lot of minutes, hasn't he? Um, and it, he, he will need a break at some point when the right time to do that is not entirely sure. And that's one of the difficult decisions Unai will have to make in the coming weeks. Now coming up, um, another short pause and we'll be hearing from Mems, uh, the brilliant Mems. It has to be said, a uh, huge fan of his. So uh, he'll be uh, sharing his thoughts in just a moment. We got there in the end, 1-0 uh, to Arsenal uh, versus Huddersfield over at the Emirates. Really frustrating game over at, uh, over at the Arsenal this afternoon. Um, we really struggled to create some chances. We did create a few chances in the first half. First, fall into a Bamiyam, a mishit shot from Granite Xhaka. Uh, Bamiyam just put it just wide. And then there was another chance after some good work from Gunduzi. Uh, it fell to Lacazette and he sort of slipped as he was striking the ball and it ballooned over. Unai Emery made his uh, customary substitutions there at half time, the double substitutions. He brought on Alex Awobi and Mkhitaryan, gave us a bit more width. Um, we was much, much more into the game in the second half, although the, the Huddersfield keeper did really not have much to do. Um, we did create some chances. Uh, Kalasinac uh, was linking up well with Awobi. Bellerin had an impact in the game. Um, but the, the goal came about 10 minutes from the end where some good work from Abamniam on the right-hand side. He got to the dead ball line. He crossed it in. And there was that signing of the summer, Lucas Torreira. Um, what a player he's turned in, in, into. You know, I, I didn't think he would be popping up and getting goals, to be honest with you. But that's now two um, that he's got. Uh, considering that he's only 22 years old, this lad can do everything. He's got he's got the engine on him. He's got the work rate. He can tackle. He can pass. He can shoot. Uh, he pop up and score goals. Um, 25 million pounds. We signed this lad from um, from Sampdoria. Now, if you compare him uh, to Fred, for example, over at Manchester United, who cost double. Um, struggling really in the Eng English game. Fabiano, I think, is struggling as well over at Liverpool. We certainly got the the sign of the summer so far in Lucas Torreira. Um, he's an absolute brilliant, brilliant player. And credit again to Unai Emery, whose uh, tactics and changes, uh, very brave substitutions. And it's worked out again. This runs keep on going. That's now 21 games unbeaten um, for the Arsenal. Um, it's a great record. We need another uh, game to beat uh, or to to draw a level with George Graham's record of 22 games and uh, long may this run continue. Didn't expect to know Emery to turn things around so quickly. Of course, it's still early days, but it's really good, interesting signs over at Arsenal. Come on, the Arsenal. Let's keep this going. Another positive gooner. That was Mems. Uh, everyone's feeling great at the moment, aren't they? Things are going well. The run continues. Uh, Arsenal are making progress. I think... Uh, one of the key points that the guys made there, though, is is there is still a lot to improve on, particularly defensively. Um, so, you know, we'll be keeping sight of that. And, and I actually went on a Love Sport radio the other day and I said something along those lines and I've been labelled as somewhat negative for that. And, and I think perhaps the, the short clip that they put out doesn't really do what I was saying justice. The point I was trying to make was that Yes, there there is progress and we're really happy with the way things are going and, and obviously uh, looking to build on it. But at the same time, we're not stupid. We are Arsenal fans. We, we, we've watched top level football for 
a really, really long time. And, and we know that we're not quite there yet. We know that there's still improvements that need to be made, particularly at the back, um, maybe in the wide areas. But, you know, it, it's, it's a work in progress, isn't it? And, and that was all I was trying to say. Uh, we won't be fooled by the run. We still know that we have some weaknesses. And, and so let's hope that Unai Emery is backed by the club and can address those, um, if not in January, then in the summer. Right, that brings us to the end of another episode. Not a very long one this week, I know, and I do apologise for that. Work has been absolutely mental this past couple of weeks, but we'll be uh, picking up once again, I I promise you. I really do. Um, Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Chronicles underscore AFC. Subscribe to us on YouTube, The Chronicles of Aguna, and on iTunes. If you are on iTunes... Uh, do leave us a review. If you're watching on YouTube, then make sure you smash that like button. In regards to our current competition, we're going to keep it rolling until Thursday's show where we'll be looking ahead to the Southampton game. Uh, So on Thursday, we'll be previewing that game, trying to work out what Unai Emery is going to do defensively given the injuries we have and uh, try and decide whether Mesa Ozil comes straight back in the team if he's fit. Um, So lots to discuss, lots to debate ahead of that one. Uh, So don't forget to tune in on Thursday. Of course, this show is sponsored by Loserport.com, a fantastic new gaming site. And if you hang on until the very end, you'll be able to hear what they are all about. My thanks to every single one of you for tuning in once again. And of course, to Mems and Chris Davison for their contributions to this week's show. I'll be back Thursday morning, nice and early. uh, So keep an eye out for our Southampton preview show. Until then, au revoir. Meet our hero. He's a smart guy who loves sports and loves outwitting other people. Our hero needs to show the world his mastery of the game. Our hero does this by playing games at loser pool. Our hero is you. Loserpool has two games. In the namesake, the games of an entire season are grouped together into weeks or rounds. After paying an entry fee, you choose one team to lose that week or round. If you're correct, you earn the right to repeat the process in the next round. But the catch is that you cannot choose a team a second time until all the teams have been chosen by you once. If you're knocked out early, you may re-enter the same pool by paying a penalty to make it fair for the other players. Or you may wait until the next pool starts in a few weeks. Razor Pool is similar to Loser Pool in that the games of an entire season are grouped together. But in this case, you pay the entry fee and predict the outcome of all the games in that week or round. You will be ranked against all other players according to your accuracy. And at the end of each round, a predetermined percentage of players will be eliminated. There is no option to buy back into a pool if you are eliminated, (laughs) and so you will have to wait until the next pool starts to play again. In both games, the prize money grows very rapidly. The pool is allocated to the last man standing, or to add a little drama, to a small surviving group if they vote according to predetermined rules. Loser Pool is about community, friendship, fun and rivalry. Discuss and debate the games and events of the week with players from around the world. Invite your friends and co-workers into your own sub-pools and see who can outsmart the group and earn bragging rights. This is your moment. Create an account. Show your sports genius. Be the hero.